Hello and welcome to this exploring session and today we are looking at Edward II by Christopher Marlowe. Uh, it is the last uh, full play, should we say, that we are looking at uh, in these exploring sessions by Christopher Marlowe. We have done all of his plays uh, 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 apart from this one apart from the B text of Dr. Faustus, but we have done Dr. Faustus. In fact, we've done Dr. Faustus, the A text twice. So, you know, the amount of text that we haven't done by Marlowe is it's very, very small. So I'm sort of saying this is, this is effectively the end of this first stage of our journey into the world of Marlowe. Uh, so uh, today we are looking at the first third-ish of the text as we uh, uh, dive into this history play. Uh, it's quite well known. If you want to see full uh, versions of this play, it is available uh, commercially in various different forms online. Uh, you can purchase these things uh, on, on DVD and uh, in different formats, in, uh, depending on where you are around the world. It is very available as a text. It is very much out there, but we are completist. So even though uh, everybody else has been here before, uh, we're going to be here as well. Reading through the text today, we have in this room, this wonderful uh, adventurers in history. And so reading uh, the first poor man, uh, Bishop of Coventry and Pembroke today is... I am Alan Scott, based in Suffolk. Uh, reading second poor man, <laughs> Warwick and Nice to King Edward is... Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian and I'm in Yorkshire. Uh, reading the third poor man, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Baldock is... Hello, I'm Francis Cox. I'm an actor living in Amsterdam. Uh, reading King Edward himself today is... Hi, I'm Tamara. I'm an actor and currently based in Germany. Uh, reading uh, Lancaster today is... Hi, I'm Eric and I'm definitely not in Lancaster. Uh, reading uh, Kent, uh, probably for most of the session, uh, depending on how far we get, and most definitely all the way through, Isabella is... Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu and I'm an author based in Longford. Reading Gaveston uh, is... Hello, I'm Emma Kemp. I'm an actor and I live in London. Uh, we have a selection of Mortimers. Reading the younger Mortimer today is... Hello, I'm Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer and director living in Germany. And reading the elder Mortimer as well as the younger Spencer is... Hi, I'm Steve Longstaff, scholar of early modern drama. I actually am in Lancaster. And, oh, I'm missing a trick there. Um, and reading Beaumont, uh, Messenger and Guard today is... A leaky chapel actor and translator, also bizarrely in Lancaster. Uh, I don't think I've missed anyone out. Do wave if I have. I'm your host, Robert Crichton, and I will be reading uh, some stage directions and uh, generally trying to navigate the text as we go. Now, uh, we don't have a prologue uh, for this particular play. The play text opens with uh well calling act one scene one enter gaveston reading a letter my father is deceased come gaveston and share the kingdom with thy dearest friend ah oh, words that make me surfeit with delight what greater bliss can hap to gaveston than live and be the favorite of a king sweet prince i come these, thy amorous lines, might have enforced me to have swung from France and, like Leander, gasped upon the sand, that I would smile and take me in thine arms. The sight of London to my exiled eyes is as Elysium to a new-come soul. Not that I love the city or the men, but that it harbours him I hold so dear, the king, upon whose bosom let me lie and with the world be still at enmity. What need the Arctic people love starlight to whom the sun shines both by day and night? Farewell base stooping to the lordly peers. My knee shall bow to none but the king. As for the multitude that are but sparks, raked up in embers of their poverty, Tanti, I'll fawn first on the wind that glanceth at my lips and flieth away. Enter three poor men. But how now? What are these? Such, Such as, as desire, desire your, your worship your service. What canst thou do? I can ride. <laughs> but I have no horse. What art thou? A traveller. Let me see. Thou wouldst do well to wait at my trencher, 
and tell me lies at dinner time. And as I like your discoursing, I'll have you. And what art thou? A soldier that hath, hath served against the Scot. Why, <clears throat> there are hospitals for such as you. I have no war, and therefore, sir, be gone. Farewell, and perish by a soldier's hand that would reward them with an hospital. Aye, aye, these words of his move me as much as if a goose should play the porcupine and dart her plumes, thinking to pierce my breast. But yet, it is no pain to speak men fair. I'll flatter these and make them live in hope. You know that I came lately out of France, and yet I have not viewed my lord the king. If I speed well, I'll entertain you all. We thank you, thank Worship. You worship. I have some business. Leave me to myself. We will wait we'll here wait about, about the, the court. Do. And exit the poor men. These are not men for me. I must have wanton poets, pleasant wits, musicians, that with touching of a string may draw the pliant king which way I please. Music and poetry is his delight. Therefore, I'll have Italian masks by night sweet speeches, comedies, and pleasing shows. And in the day, when he shall walk abroad, like sylvan nymphs, my pages shall be clad. Like men, like satyrs grazing on the lawns, shall with their goat feet dance the antic hay. Sometime, a lovely boy in Diane's shape, with hair that gilds the water as it glides, crownets of pearl about his naked arms, and in his sportful hands an olive tree, to hide those parts which men delight to see, shall bathe him in a spring, and there, hard by, one like Axion peeping through the grove, shall by the angry goddess be transformed, and running in the likeness of an heart, by yelping hounds pulled down, shall seem to die. Such things as these best please his majesty. Here comes my lord the king and the nobles from the parliament. I'll stand aside. And so Gaveston retires to one side as enter King Edward, Kent Lancaster, the elder Mortimer, the younger Mortimer, uh, Warwick Pembroke and attendants et al. Lancaster. My lord. Earl of Lancaster, I do abhor. Will you not grant me this? In spite of them... I'll have my will, and these two Mortimers that cross me thus shall know I am displeased. If you love us, my lord, hate Gaveston. That villain Mortimer, I'll be his death. Mine uncle here, this earl, and I myself were sworn to your father at his death that he should ne'er return into the realm. And now, my lord, ere I will break my oath, this sword of mine that should offend your foes shall sleep within the scabbard at thy need, and underneath thy banners march who will, for Mortimer will hang his armour up. Mordieu. Well, Mortimer, I'll make thee rue these words. Beseems it thee to contradict thy king, frowns thou thereat, aspiring Lancaster. The sword shall plain the furrows of thy brows, and hew these knees that now are grown so stiff. I'll have Gaston, and you shall know what danger it is to stand against your king. Well done, Ned. <laughs> My lord, why do you thus incense your peers that would naturally that naturally would love and honor you, but for that base and obscure Gaveston? Four earldoms have I besides Lancaster. Derby. Salisbury, Lincoln, Leicester. These will I sell to give my soldiers pay ere Gaveston stay within the realm. Therefore, if he become, expel him straight. Barons and earls, your pride hath made me miss. From so I'll speak, and to the proof I hope. I do remember in my father's days. Lord Percy of the North, being highly moved, brave Mowbray in the presence of the king, for which, had he had not his highness loved him well, he should have lost his head. But with his look, the naughty spirit of Percy was appeased, and Mowbray and he were reconciled. Yet dare you brave the king unto his face. Brother, revenge it, and let these fair heads preach upon poles for trespass of their tongues. Oh. Our heads. Aye, yours, and therefore I would wish you grant. 
bridle thy anger, gentle Mortimer. I cannot, nor I will not, I must speak. Cousin, our hands, I hope, shall fence our heads and strike off his that makes you threaten us. Come, uncle, let us leave the brain-sick king and henceforth parley with our naked swords. Will she have men enough to save our heads? All Warwickshire will leave him for my sake. And northward Lancaster hath many friends. Adieu, my lord, and either change your mind or look to see the throne where you should sit to float in blood, and at thy wanton head, the glossy, glossing head of thy base minion throne. And exuant all except uh, King Edward, Kent, uh, Gaveston, and attendants. I cannot brook these haughty menaces. Am I a king and must be overruled? Rather display my ensigns in the field. I'll bandy with the barons and the earls, and either die or live with Gaveston. I can no longer keep me from my lord. What, Gaveston? Welcome. Kiss not my hand. Embrace me, Gaveston, as I do thee. Why wouldst thou kneel, knowest thou not who I am? Thy friend, thyself another Gaveston. Not Hylas was more mournful of Hercules than thou hast been of me since thy exile. And since I went from hence, no soul in hell hath felt more torment than poor Gaveston. I know it. Brother, welcome home, my friend. Now let the treacherous Mortimus conspire and that high-minded Earl of Lancaster. I have my wish in and in that I joy thy sight. And sooner shall the sea o'erwhelm my land than bear the ship that shall transport thee hence. I here create thee Lord High Chamberlain, Chief Secretary to the State and me, Earl of Cornwall, King and Lord of Man. The, my lord, these titles far exceed my worth. Brother, the least of these may well suffice for one of greater birth in Gaveston. Cease, brother, for I cannot brook these words. Thy worth, sweet friend, is far above my gifts. Therefore, to equal it, receive my heart. If for these dignities thou be envied, I'll give thee more. For but to honour thee is Edward pleased with kingly regiment. Fierce thou thy person, thou shalt have a guard. Wantest thou gold, go to my treasury. Wouldst thou be loved and feared, receive my seal. Save or condemn, and in our name command, whatso thy mind affects or fancy likes. It shall suffice me to enjoy your love, which, whilst I have, I think myself as great as Caesar riding in the Roman street with captive kings at his triumphant car. And enter the Bishop of Coventry. Whither goes my Lord of Coventry so fast? Celebrate your father's equities. But is that wicked Gaveston returned? Ay, priest, and lives to be revenged on thee, that wert the only cause of his exile. Tis true, and, but for reverence of these robes, thou shouldst not plod one foot beyond this place. I did no more than I was bound to do. And, Gaveston, unless thou be reclaimed, as then I did incense the Parliament, so will I now, and thou shalt back to France. Saving your reverence, you must pardon me. Throw off his golden meters, rend his stole, and in the channel christian him anew. I, brother, lay not violent hands on him, for he will complain unto the sea of Rome. Let him complain unto the sea of hell. I'll be revenged on him for my exile. No. Spare his life, but seize upon his goods. Be thou, Lord Bishop and receive his rents, and make him serve thee as thy chaplain. I give him thee, here, use him as thou wilt. He shall to prison, and there die in bolts. I to the tower, the fleet, or where thou wilt. This offence be thou accursed of God. Who's there? Convey this priest to the tower. True, true. But, in the meantime, Gaveston, away, and take possession of his house and goods, 
Come follow me, and thou shalt have my guard to see it done and bring thee safe again. What should a priest do with so fair a house? A prison may be seen his holiness. And they exit. Quite a lot happens in scene one. I mean, it's it's all go. Um, uh, and it goes through sort of various units of action. It's really interesting. We start with Gaveston. We start inside Gaveston's head, reading a letter. We encounter these poor men. And he's got this lovely, I really love the line. It's no pain to speak men fair. I'll flatter these uh, uh, and make them live in hope. I, 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 th I think that speaks uh, really interestingly of, of Gaveston. A little chat with some poor men, continues talking to himself, and then he sort of watches Parliament occurring, where they're all going, gah, can't stand Gaveston, gah, gah, what a git, um, generally speaking. And, and it all is, is kicking off into this violent terms before Gaveston even comes in. That, that, you know, it's, it's that, that they, they can't stand Gaveston to the point where they will go to war, even with Gaveston not technically known to be in present. Um, and then when he does appear, we're, we're getting to the point where we're kicking, kicking um, bishops around um, and, and, and ducking, uh, uh, threatening to duck them in the river. So, yeah, it's it really throws stuff at you. Um, it doesn't hang around. Uh, thoughts from the room. Um, Eric. What I found interesting was that the king made him uh, Lord what was it lord chamberlain or something you know all those titles but in private he didn't do it in public because obviously there's too much unrest uh, and too much disagreement mm. Mm. Uh, other thoughts uh alan a couple of thoughts uh one there was obviously a lot of resentment among the hereditary nobility about uh, what someone they see as an outsider and a revist um the other one is textual, and the line I had as the bishop, true, true, I can't quite work out what that's supposed to be agreeing to. Uh, it, it, it just seems a bit random. Sarcasm is the footnote I've got here, but we can agree or disagree on that, that one. Um, uh, thoughts on that or other things? Aliki then Francis. Other things, uh, just that the language between Gaveston and the king is genuinely very loving and tender. It doesn't look kind of, um, he's not, he doesn't look like he's using him, although perhaps he is, but, and that's nice. Mm. Uh, Francis. Yeah, I was just taken aback by the um, homoeroticism almost from the get go. Um, and then you had that, um, speech of Gaveston's where he says something like uh, and in uh, here we go and in his sportful hands an olive tree to hide those parts which men delight to see yeah I was just like holy shit you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, and, and a bit like Kaliki I'm trying to figure out whether um, uh, Gaveston really does have a genuine affection for King Edward, or is he using him to uh, aggrandise himself and uh, enrich himself, or is it a bit of both? Yeah, I, 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 I would always suspect that it's, it is a bit of both. You can have genuine affection and also be sitting there going, I'm going to get a lot of money out of this. Um, the social status, uh, as Alan pointed out earlier as well, is, is really important here. They're constantly talking about the 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 titles and the uh, the the level of society that people are living in. We start a play with poor men uh, looking for advancement from Gaveston. Gaveston is getting advancement from people higher up than him. People are higher up than him, but not as high as the king. Are not happy about that change in status, uh, and the way they're talking about status is really really interesting. Um, other thoughts, Helen? Yeah, I mean, one of the problems is that Richard is not. Uh, not Richard, sorry, Edward, is not dividing the personal from the political. So it's, it's one thing to have a friend, a friend of whom the church would deeply disapprove, um, but it's quite another thing to give him political office. Um, and I think there are two very separate problems here, but Richard, uh, why will I continually call him Richard? Edward. Yeah, I know. But Edward is very, um, Edward is utterly reckless. 
And also there's this sort of uh, the, the suggestion that, you know, Edward is uh, not unwilling and is perfectly content with the idea of, of, of fighting for things. You know, there, there's the sense that this, this person uh, knows what he's doing uh, and, and can handle himself in a fight. Uh, well, that's my sort of uh, impression. Maybe a big scout fight. I'm not necessarily talking hand-to-hand -hand combat or anything. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Um, Sarah, uh, then Francis. Yeah, I just, the fact that Helen kept calling him Richard, I, I was, I was, think, I was doing the same thing in my head because of because of um, Woodstock, mm. um, and the caterpillars, and 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 all that business with the with the seal and everything, and um, I was just thinking they they those two this play with that play would probably make quite a good double bill, maybe I don't mm. know. And there, there is a lot of overlap with some of the language used in the two plays, minions, uh, caterpillars, etc. There, there, there does seem to be so, one has obviously read the other. Uh, this is later, seen. I assume, is it? Uh, uh, it just depends on your opinion as to precisely when Woodstock is produced. Uh, oh, okay. uh, yeah, it has, it, it, All right. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's, uh, it's probably after. Um, uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, Woodstock is probably after this. Um, so it's 1592. This uh, and uh, and yeah. So uh, uh, and it, it does seem to be that's the direction of communication. It does seem that uh, lots of ideas may have been borrowed from here, okay. uh, which is cool. We can we can steal stuff. That's fine. Other thoughts, uh, Francis. Yeah, I was looking for clues as to what Gaveston had done to uh, to deserve exile in France and the enmity of the uh, of the nobles. Um, yeah, is it was it because um, he, uh, he was a, a, um, a commoner with ideas above his station? Was it because uh, he was enjoying the affections of uh, of Edward? Uh, we don't seem to get any any idea of you know why they don't like him. Uh, Helen. Well, I think the church doesn't like him for his immorality. Right. I, I think, again, it's probably all those things. Uh, uh, but um, it, uh, partly it depends on what spin you want to be going with the production uh, and how you want to, how you want to frame uh, the various issues and, and, and what weight you give them. Uh, Eric? What I found interesting was that the, we were talking earlier about language, that the, the novels are definitely not hiding anything. Uh, they're just... It's like no subtlety at all, which you would expect in, in, I mean, you'd expect there to be a sort of level of subtlety, but then clearly they despise him so much that um, they think it's such a big problem that they have to say it straight to the king's face. They don't, they don't seem to have any uh, you know, a compunction at all, do they? They are just going for him um, quite openly. Uh, last uh, thought, uh, I'll come to Francis in a moment, uh, that I was going to throw in, is that Gaveston's asides, you know, that he is effectively commentating uh, on, on the scene in front of him. Uh, and actually, we had a, a little bit of that the other week uh, when we were looking at Conflict of Conscience, uh, which is a much earlier play, uh, where we have these uh, interesting asides by a character uh, that nobody else is hearing apart from the audience. And I'm wondering how commonplace by this point that as a technique was being used, whether there are other plays. Uh, I don't can't think of many other plays that use it relatively extensively during a scene, this kind of ongoing commentary. Um, uh, so it's it's an interesting thing about that as an innovation or an ongoing process uh, in in the uh, the toolkit, uh, Francis. Yeah, I just I was just wondering how old is Edward uh, at this point in time because um, his age uh, may affect the way uh, the nobles treat him. Mm. Uh, and that's again a question for the production because of course in a theatrical production odds on you've got to, it, it he's going to remain visually uh within a, a certain span of his uh, lifetime depending on how long the the play covers uh, and what the logic of time is uh we need to move on uh hold on to any thoughts you may have had uh for further down the line uh a slightly shorter scene act one scene two as i have it uh, enter on one side uh the elder uh mortimer and the younger and on the other warwick and lancaster i'm not 100 certain if that is an accurate uh from the printing or whether that is inferred it is true the bishop is in the tower and goods and body given to Gaveston. What? Will they tyrannise upon the church? Oh, wicked king, accursed Gaveston. This ground which is corrupted with their steps shall be their timeless sepulchre or mine. 
Well, let that peevish Frenchman guard him sure. Unless his breast be sword-proof, he shall die. How now? Why droops the Earl of Lancaster? Well, wherefore is Guy of Warwick discontent? That villain, Gaveston, is made an earl. An earl? Aye. And besides, Lord Chamberlain of the realm, and secretary too, and Lord of Man. We may not, nor we will not, suffer this. Why post we not from hence to levy men? My lord of Cornwall now at every word, and happy is the man whom he vouchsafes for bailing of his bonnet one good look. Thus arm in arm he and the king doth march. They more the guard upon his lordship waits, and all the court begins to flatter him. Thus, leaning on the shoulder of the king, he nods and scorns and smiles at those that pass. Doth no man take exception at the slave? All stomach him, but none dare speak a word. Yeah, that bewrays their baseness, Lancaster. Were all the earls and barons of my mind, we'd hail him from the bosom of the king and at the court gate hang the peasant up, who, swollen with venom of ambitious pride, will be the ruin of the realm and us. Here comes my lord of Canterbury's grace. His countenance berates, he is displeased. Enter the Archbishop of Canterbury with an attendant. First were his sacred garments rent and torn, then laid they violent hands upon him, next himself imprisoned and his goods are seized. This certified the Pope, away, take horse. And the attendant exits. My Lord, will you take arms against the King? What need I? God himself is up in arms when violence is offered to the church. Then will you join with us that be his peers to banish or behead that Gaveston? What else, my lord, for it concerns me near. The bishopric, bishopric of Coventry is his. Enter Queen Isabella. Madam, whither walks your majesty so fast? Ah, Madam? muted, muted Queen Isabella. Unto the forest, gentle Mortimer, to live in grief and baleful discontent. For now, my lord, the king regards me not, but dotes upon the love of Gaveston. He claps his cheeks and hangs about his neck, smiles in his face and whispers into his ears. And when I come, he frowns, as who should say, Go whither thou wilt, seeing I have Gaveston. Is it not strange that he thus it bewitched. Madam, return unto the court again. That sly, inveigling Frenchman will exile or lose our lives. And yet, ere that day come, the king shall lose his crown, for we have power and courage too to be revenged at full. But yet lift not your swords against the king. Oh, but we will lift Gaveston from hence. And war must be the means, or he'll stay still. Then let him stay, for rather than my lord shall be oppressed with civil mutinies, I will endure a melancholy life, and let him fully with his minion. My lords, to ease all this, but hear me speak. We and the rest that are his counsellors will meet, and with the general consent, Confirm his banishment with our hands and seals. What we confirm, the king will frustrate. Then may we lawfully revolt from him. But say, my lord, where shall this meeting be? At the new temple. Content. And in the meantime, I'll entreat you all to cross to Lambeth and there stay with me. Come then, let's away. Madam, farewell. Farewell, sweet Mortimer, and for my sake, forbear to levy arms against the king. Aye, if words will serve. If not, I must. And they exit. Um, yes, yeah, so plotting, 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 plotting. Younger Mortimer doesn't half go for it, doesn't he? You know, um, you know, uh, the, the, just we may lawfully revolt from him. I'm going, well, really? Or are you just really keen? on the whole revolting thing. Yeah. Um, a bit of revolting. Yeah. 
yeah thoughts in the room on uh, on introducing new characters and uh, uh, ex furthering of things elizabeth i think that the scene that's coming up is the shortest scene we've ever had i i wanted to know if you can think of a shorter scene than this one uh, yes, indeed. The next scene is only five lines long. There might be shorter. Um, uh, I mean, it depends if you describe uh, some some battle scenes or whatever. I suppose could technically be shorter. Um, but yes, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Uh, I'm going to make a note to start hunting for shorter scenes. I'm sure someone knows of a shorter scene in terms of the number of words. I'm sure it's come up on the internet somewhere. Uh, other thoughts about this scene before we move on. Stephen, you look like oh, you it, want it to... Was, it was just to do with the, the kind of social structures that um, that, there is, that this play is based on. This is kind of earlier social setup with regards to the court, that's all, that you had, you know, very powerful magnets with access to private armies on the Scottish and Welsh borders, particularly. Um, and the, the, the court of Henry VIII is a sort of massive centralising... Uh, attempt to emasculate this effectively and, and head off a future civil war. So it's a, it's a previous setup. It's not like they're all sort of swanning around the court, uh, Elizabethan style. You know, these, these are kind of uh, 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 bosses with access to serious resource. That was, that was all. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I do love the way that people just sort of wander in, just uh, with, with carrying grievances with them. I love the Archbishop of Canterbury just going, right, this is what he did, right, off to the Pope now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they're asking, do you want to join us? You go, well, uh, frankly, God's already already uh, 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 take, taking arms on this front. So um, God's already displeased. So, uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, and then into this comes Queen Isabella, uh, who... Uh, is sort of trapped a bit between a rock and a hard place. Of course, uh, you know, in theory, she should be all on the side of the king. But uh, Isabella's, um, you know, urging, don't don't levy arms against the king, but uh, is not wholly unsympathetic, or is, or not? Thoughts? Uh, uh, Helen? Yes, I, I mean, it would be nice at this stage if Mortimer and, and Isabella were showing a little sympathy towards each other. Mm. Uh, sorry, shouldn't get ahead of myself. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, I, I, ideally not. Any other thoughts before we move on? Eric? I, I was going to say that it's interesting how the setup sort of, you know, you've got on one inside the elder Mortimer, the, the Mortimer family, and then you've got Warwick and Lancaster, and uh, I'm guessing that's quite, sur like, supposedly they bump into each other or something, I don't know, or it, it, how, is that supposed to be accidental? Just the, the way it's set up feels very sort of, oh yes, look, well, we happen to pass each other in the hallway, let's talk about a revolution. <laughs> That's the corridors of power for you. It's all West Wing. Uh, okay, we're going to move on. We're going to read the next two scenes, one after the other, because as the next scene is incredibly short, uh, we'll elide it straight into the one afterwards. So Act 1, Scene 3, as I've got it here. Enter Gaveston and Kent. Edmund, the mighty prince of Lancaster, hath more earldoms than an ass can bear, and both the Mortimers, two goodly men, with Guy of Warwick, that redoubted knight, are gone towards Lambeth. There let them remain. And exit uh, exit uh, Gaveston there. Um, not a happy bunny. Act one, scene four. Enter Lancaster, Warwick, Pembroke, the elder Mortimer, the younger Mortimer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and all those generally displeased people. Here is the form of Gaveston's exile. May it please your lordship to subscribe your name. Give me the paper. And uh, the Archbishop subscribes as the others do after him. So they're all writing on the paper uh, on the form of Gaveston's exile. Quick, quick, my lord, I long to write my name. But I long more to see him banished hence. The name of Mortimer shall fright the king, unless he be declined from that base peasant. And uh, the enter King Edward, Gaveston and Kent. What? Are you moved that Gaveston sits here? It is our pleasure. We will have it so. 
Your brace doth well to place him by his side, for nowhere else is the new uh, nowhere else the new earl is so safe. A man of noble birth can brook this sight. Quam male convenient. See what a scornful look the peasant casts. And kingly lions fall on creeping ants. Ignoble vassal, that like Phaeton <laughs> aspirest unto the guidance of the sun. Their downfall is at hand, their forces down. We will not thus be faced and overpeered. Lay hands on that traitor, Mortimer. Lay hands on that traitor, Gaveston. This the duty that you owe your king. We know our duties. Let him know his peers. Whither will you bear him? Stay, or you shall die. We are no traitors. Therefore, threaten not. No, threaten not, my lord, but pay them home. Were I a king, thou, villain, wherefore talkst thou of a king that hardly art a gentleman by birth? Were he a peasant, being my minion, I'll make the proudest of you stoop to him. My lord, you may not thus disparage us. Away, I say, with hateful Gaveston. And with the Earl of Kent that favours him. And attendants remove Gaveston and Kent. Nay, then, lay violent hands upon your king. Here, Mortimer, sit thou in Edward's throne. Warwick and Lancaster, where you my crown. Was ever king thus overruled as I? Learn then to rule us better and the realm. What we have done, our hot blood shall maintain. Think you that we can brook this upstart's pride? Anger and wrathful fury stops my speech. Why are you not moved? Be patient, my lord, and see what we, your counsellors, have done. My lords, now let us all be resolute, and either have our wills or lose our lives. Meet you for this, proud over daring peers. Ere my sweet Gaveston shall part from me, this isle shall fleet upon the ocean and wander to the unfrequented Ind. You know that I am legate to the Pope. On your allegiance to the See of Rome, subscribe as we have done to his exile. Curse him if he refuse, and then may we, dep and then may, may we depose him and elect another king. Aye, there it goes, but yet I will not yield. Curse me, depose me, do the worst you can. Then linger not, my lord, but do it straight. Remember how the bishop was abused. Either banish him that was the cause thereof, or I will presently discharge these lords of duty and allegiance due to thee. It boots me not to threat I must speak fair. The legate of the Pope will be obeyed. My lord, you shall be Chancellor of the realm, thou Lancaster, High Admiral of our fleet. Young Mortimer and his uncle shall be earls, and you, Lord Warwick, President of the North, and thou of Wales. If this content you not, make several kingdoms of this monarchy, and share it equally amongst you all, so I may have some nook or corner left to frolic with my dearest Gavister. Nothing shall alter us. We are resolved. Come, come, subscribe. Why should you love him whom the world hates so? Because he loves me more than all the world. And none but rude and savage-minded men would seek the ruin of my Gavison. You that be noble-born shall pity him. You that are princely-born should shake him off. Oh, for shame, subscribe, and let the clown depart. Urge him, my lord. Are you content to banish him the realm? I see. I must, and therefore am content. Instead of ink, I'll write it with my tears. Oh, the king is lovesick for his minion. Tis done, and now a cursed hand full off. Give it me. I'll have it published in the streets. I'll see him presently dispatched away. Now is my heart at ease. And so is mine. This will be good news to the common sort. Well, be it or no, we shall not linger here. And exuant all except King Edward. And we're going to pause there because this is a massive scene. Um, the scenes just flow into each other and there's sort of no real way of 
sufficiently breaking them up because there is constant ongoing action. Younger Mortimer, uh, yeah, he does really love just saying treason in front of everybody, doesn't he? I mean, there's just no, no filter on this man no, at all. No, I was thinking that as I was reading it, I was like, shut up, mate. Like, you're seriously, you're going to get hanged. But he's just, <laughs> he just goes for it, doesn't he? I suppose they are all in a, the ascendant. You know, they've they've turned up with a bit of paper. It's the pace of the dialogue as well. It's choppy lines, mm. one after the other, and then just going and they're sort of barging each other out the way. No, let me let me write. Let, let me. I want to. I want to put my name on on getting rid of Gaveston. Yeah, yeah. Sign up here, mate. Sign up here. Um, and, and King Edward. I mean, it, it, I just love the way he just turns up and just goes. So, to, well, you 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 want the threat? You, you sit in the throne, then, mate. Uh, you know, uh, that's what you're doing here. Um, cheek of it all. Um, and yet, and they're still constantly talking about uh, class and uh, and, uh, and and status, and uh, and it's just it just keeps going and keeps going. Um, uh, thoughts in the room. Thoughts in the room. Um, uh, Aliki. I'm just astounded by that line of Edwards that starts with an aside. Well, I can't go against the priest. Here, take everything. Take the whole kingdom. Just your corner to cuddle with Gaveston. And it's, I, that's right. He does say that to them. That just the first bit is an aside. Right? Or am I nuts? So he says... Um, uh, bah, 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 bah. Well, it boots me boots not to me threat. Not to threat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, so the first bit is an aside, and then... Yeah. Um, so he says it straight out. You take the kingdom. Divide mm. it up between, between yourselves. Just just let me have Gaveston. And they say mm. no. Wow. Yeah, they really hate Gaveston. Yeah, but I mean, that's a, that's a really astonishing thing for me to say, to, for him to say politically, to me. Just like a, it drops like a cannonball. Mm. Uh, Stephen? We've already had Gaveston saying speak there, haven't we? I wonder if there's there's a kind of callback to that. If Gaveston is obviously just just saying it, you know, there's, it's only words to him. So so perhaps it, the echo there, I must speak there, that's kind of code for all, you know, everything that now follows. <laughs> I've got my fingers crossed behind my back because we've seen that already with, with Gaveston. I just wondered why. Uh, I was wondering why in that first scene, why they bothered with that. Uh, maybe it's to do with speaking fair. Mm, yeah, it, it's it's the fact that there, there is just no room for manoeuvre for Gaveston. I mean, he might be a bit, uh, you know, a, a bit self-serving, but so far he hasn't had a chance to do anything, you know, unpleasant or, or, or bad or oh. intemperate or, you know, to, to warrant this, uh, this, uh, this, this attack in that sense. Uh, unless I'm missing something. Uh, Helen, then Eric. Yeah, I think you are missing something. He has imprisoned a bishop, stripped him of his um, episcopal trappings, uh, taken his goods and chattels to himself, which is pretty fair. Uh, I mean, the church would on the whole disapprove. Or also, I think there is a complete breakdown of trust between the, the nobles and, and, and the king. Um, am I right in thinking that Kent is the king's brother? Oh, I can answer that. I think just, so. Uh, yeah. I should yeah. be able to answer that in just a moment, yes. Uh, Kent is brother to the king, yes. Yeah, which explains his allegiance and the mm. fact why he isn't rushing off with the rest of the nobles. Yeah. Yes, not, all, not everybody is not on Edward's side in that sense, yeah. Um... Uh, Eric, sorry, yes. Yeah, uh, the I was going to go back to Leaky's point, which is basically like you know, sort of, uh, it's it feels like not just handing over land, but also handing over like administrative control, which is basically what the king does. I mean, like you know, uh, he, he kind of goes, just piss off and leave me alone. I don't want to spend my time with this guy. Mm. Uh, okay, other thoughts before we continue the scene? Because, of course, we haven't actually finished this scene. Uh, Elizabeth? I was going to say the plot really thickens here. I like the way the, the intrigue is, like, gradual, but also really compelling. Mm. 
yeah, it, it, it's got such momentum, this play. It really mm. has. I mean, it's packing a lot in um, in, in, in uh, all of this. So say, that's where the choppy dialogue comes in. People aren't actually making that. There are a few longish speeches, but they're actually moving um, and but there's also a lot of just dialogue, da, 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 stuff people aren't hearing um, necessarily. It's it's really interestingly put together. Any final thoughts before we continue into this scene? No. Okay. So Edward has been left alone. He's been forced to subscribe. He's he's had to write uh, the name on the uh, bit of paper. Uh, Gaveston was, uh, and his brother was herded off stage earlier. So uh, Edward was, is, was alone with all the people who were not on his side. And now he is alone literally with himself. How fast they run to banish him I love. They would not stir were it to do me good. Where should a king be subject to a priest? Proud Rome that hatches such imperial grooms with these thy superstitious taper lights, wherewith thy anti Christian churches blaze. I'll fire thy crazed buildings and enforce the papal towers to kiss the lowly ground with slaughtered priests, make Tiber's channel swell, and banks raised higher with their sepulchres. As for the peers that back the clergy, thus, if I be king, not one of them shall live. Return Gaveston. My lord, I hear it whispered everywhere that I am banished and must fly the land. Tis true, sweet Gaveston, oh, were it false, the legate of the Pope will have it so, and thou must hence or I shall be deposed. But I will reign to be revenged of them, and therefore, sweet friend, take it patiently. Live where thou wilt, I'll send thee gold enough. And long thou shalt not stay, or if thou dost, I'll come to thee. My love shall ne'er decline. Is all my hope turned to this hell of grief? Rend not my heart with thy two piercing words, thou from this land I from myself am banished. To go from hence grieves not, poor Gaveston, but to forsake you, in whose gracious looks the blessedness of Gaveston remains for nowhere else seeks he felicity. And only this torments my wretched soul, that whether I will or no, thou must depart. Be governor of Ireland in my stead, and there abide till fortune call thee home. Here, take my picture, and let me wear, wear thine. And they exchange uh, pictures. Or might I keep thee here as I do this? Happy were I, but now most miserable. Is something to be pitied of a king. Thou shalt not hence, I'll hide, hide thee, Gaveston. I shall be found, and then twill grieve me more. Kind words and mutual talk makes our grief greater, therefore with dumb embracement let us part. Stay, Gaveston, I cannot leave thee thus. For every look my love drops down a tear, seeing I must go, but do not renew my sorrow. The time is little that thou hast to stay, and therefore give me leave to look my fill. But come, sweet friend, I'll bear thee on thy way. The peers will frown. I pass not for their anger. Come, let's go, oh, that we might as well return as go. Enter Queen Isabella. Uh, Queen Isabella, enter. Fall not on me, French strumpet. Get thee gone. From my husband should I fall? On Mortimer, with whom, ungentle queen, I judge no more. Judge you the rest, my lord. Thou wrongest me, Gaveston. Is it not enough that thou corruptest my lord and art a bore to his affections, but thou must call mine honour thus in question? I mean not so. Your grace must pardon me. Thou art too familiar with that Mortimer, and by thy means is Gaveston exiled. But I would wish thee reconcile the lords, or thou shalt ne'er be reconciled to me. Your highness knows it lies not in my power. Away then. Touch me not. Come, Gaveston. Villain, tis thou that robbest me of my lord. Madam. 
Tis you that rob me of my lord. Speak not unto her, let her droop and pine. My lord, how I deserve these words. Who is this tears that Isabella sheds? Who is this heart that sign for thee breaks? How dear my lord is to poor Isabel. And witness heaven how dear thou art to me. There, for to my Gaveston be repealed, assure thyself thou comest not in my sight. Uh, Exuant King Edward and Gaveston leave Queen Isabella. O oh, miserable and distressed queen, would when I left sweet France and was embarked, that charming Circe, walking on the waves, had changed my shape. Or at the marriage day, the cup of Hymen had been full of poison. Or with those arms that twined about my neck, I had been stifled and not lived to see the king, my lord, thus to abandon me. Like frantic Juno, will I fill the earth with ghastly murmur of my sighs and cries. For never doted Joe or Ganymede so much as he on cursed Gaveston. But that will it more exasperate his wrath. I must entreat him. I must speak him fair and be a means to call home Daveston. And yet he'll ever dote on Daveston. And so am I forever miserable. Uh, re enter lots of lords to the scene. We have the return of Lancaster, Warwick, Pembroke, the elder Mortimer, and of course the younger Mortimer. Look where the sister of the King of France sits, wringing, uh, wringing of her hands and beats her breast. The King, I fear, hath ill-treated her. Hard is the heart that injures such a saint. I know it is long of Gaveston she weeps. Why, he is gone. Madam, how fares your grace? Ah, oh, Mortimer, now makes the king's hate forth, and he confesseth that he loves me not. Cry quittance, madam, then, and love not him. No, rather will I die a thousand deaths, and yet I love in vain, who ne'er love me. Hear ye not, madam, now his minions gone, his want and humour will quickly be left. For Lancaster, I am enjoined to sue unto you all for his repeal. This rules my lord, and this must I perform, or else be banished from his highness' presence. For his repeal, madam, he comes not back, unless the sea cast up his shipwrecked body. And to behold so sweet a sight as that, there's none here but would run his horse to death. But, madam, would you have us call him home? I, Mortimer, for, till you be restored, the angry king have banished me from the court, and therefore, as thou lovest and tendest me, be thou my advocate unto these peers. What would you have me plead for Gaveston? Plead for him that will, I'm resolved. And so am I, my lord, dissuade the queen. Let him dissuade the king, for truth against my will he should return. Then speak not for him, let the peasant go. Tis for myself I speak, and not for him. No speaking will prevail, and therefore cease. Fair queen, for better angle for the fish which, being caught, strikes him that takes it dead. I mean that vile torpedo, Gaveston. Now, I hope, floats on the Irish seas. Sweet Mortimer, sit down by me a while, and I will tell thee reasons of such weight as thou wilt soon subscribe to his repeal. It is impossible, but speak your mind. Then, thus, but none shall hear it but ourselves. And talks to uh, uh, talks to younger Mortimer apart. Lords, albeit the queen win Mortimer, will you be resolute and hold with me? Not I, against my nephew. Fear not, the queen's words cannot alter him. No, but do but mark how earnestly she pleads. And see how coldly his looks make denial. She smiles. Now for my life his mind is changed. I'll rather lose his friendship, I, than grant. Well, 
Of necessity, it must be so. My lords, that I abhor base Gaveston, I hope your honours make no question, and therefore, though I plead for his repeal, tis not for his sake, but to our avail, nay, for the realm's behoof, and for the king's. Fie, Mortimer, dis dishonour not thyself. Can this be true to us good to banish him? And is this true to call him home again? <laughs> Such reasons make white, black, and dark night day. My lord of Lancaster, mark the respect. In no respect can contraries be true. Yet stood, my lord, hear what he can allege. All that he speaks is nothing. We are resolved. Do you not wish that Gaveston were dead? I would he were. Why then, my lord, give me but leave to speak. Nephew, do not play the sophister. This which I urge is of a burning zeal to mend the king and do our country good. Know you not, Gaveston hath store of gold which may in Ireland purchase him such friends as he will front the mightiest of us all? And whereas he shall live and be beloved, tis hard for us to work his overthrow. Mark you but that, my lord of Lancaster. But were he here, detested as he is, how easily might some base slave be suborned to greet his lordship with a poignard? And none so much as blame the murderer, but rather praise him for that brave attempt, and in the chronicle enroll his name for purging the realm of such a plague. He says true. Aye, but how chance this was not done before? Because, my lords, it was not thought upon. Nay more, when he shall know it lies in us to banish him, and then to call him home, twill make him veil the top flag of his pride, and fear to offend the meanest nobleman. And how if he do not, nephew? Then may we with some colour rise in arms. For howsoever we have borne it out, tis treason to be up against the king. So shall we have the people of our side, which for his father's sake lean to the king, but cannot brook a night-grown mushroom. Such a one as my lord of Cornwall is should bear us down of the nobility. And when the commons and the nobles join, tis not the king can buckle Gaveston. We'll pull him from the strongest hold he hath. My lords, if to perform this I be slack, think me as base a groom as Gaveston. On that condition, Lancaster will grant. And so will Pembroke, and I. And I. In this I count me highly gratified, and Mortimer will rest at your command. And when this favour Isabel forgets, then let her live abandoned and forlorn. But see, in happy time, my lord the king, having brought the Earl of Cornwall on his way, is new returned. This news will glad him much, yet not so much as me. I love him more than he can Gaveston. Would he love me but half so much? Then will I treble blessed. And we're just going to pause there as King Edward re-enters uh, in all sad, like all morningy. Um, so yes, this is a uh, massive reverse ferret uh, positioning here. Um, Isabella. Um, coming on, uh, seeing Edward walking off with Gaveston. Um, for not on me, French trumpet, get thee gone. Edward, Edward obviously thinks uh, a lot of her. Um, Gaveston's the one who's uh, uh, tries to do some sort of uh, uh, attempts at re reconciliation, not very successfully. And yeah, Isabella is left in this situation where she has to appeal to the, uh, the lords to... Uh, to undo the uh, the banishment. Um, so yeah, it's it's an interesting scene that's going from one direction to another direction and back and forth and uh, the sort of you know the the things that Mortimer's doing. What what did Isabella say to Mortimer to convince him? Uh, we are not privy to that information. Uh, we presume though that she's the one who gave him the assassination idea, right? Because. He's not that uh, he's not that subtle a thinker by the evidence so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm willing to go with that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got the impression that I was just repeating what she just said to me. And, and he just thought, oh, that's a good idea. Lords, what about this? Um, 
Though I do love the response of Mortimer, you know, when Lancaster says, how chance this was not done before because we didn't think of it. <laughs> Which Takes I, I a was... woman's touch. <laughs> a woman's touch. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I just, I just love the, that, that, that as a line. Just, yeah, didn't think of it. Yeah. Um, Eric. What was shocking was the way the, uh, the king was behaving to his wife, sort of in public as well. So we're going French strumpet and all that stuff. You're like, okay, um, you know, just <laughs> to calm down, <laughs> tone it down a bit. Because he's just ex exchanged, you know, these tokens with Gaveston. They've, they've had this farewell, and then she arrives, and it's it becomes, yeah, very heated, very fast. Aliki then Sarah. Um, I said this in the chat. This is emotional abuse. They're they're bullying her, the pair of them, and I really feel terribly sorry for her. But she's very bright. <laughs> Sarah. Uh, yeah, I just thought it was a beautiful bit of, um, you know. Uh, structure um from marlow because that scene was quite affecting i mean i'm st the jury's still out with me whether uh, gaveston actually feels for the king what the king feels for gaveston but clearly the king is genuinely you know genuinely loves this man and it, it was just such a you know I, I was really feeling for the king in that scene and kind of he had all my sympathy and empathy and then isabella turns up and all of a sudden he turns into this absolute jerk. And I just thought that was a beautiful bit of cleverness um, because you're, you know, he's playing with your, the playwrights playing with your um, em emotions um, and, and making you switch sides constantly, which is just such a great way of getting the audience to um, like feel in some kind of tangible way, the, the, the quality of, of um, the complexity rather of, of, of of the political situation and what's going on yeah and it's it's um it, it it's one of these situations where uh you know they all all these lords start with this entrenched position gaveston must go gaveston must go they get rid of gaveston and then they're given a reason why actually no we for expediency's sake we're gonna have him back and, and you know the, the the way people can be talked into and out of things you know yeah. nobody's position is absolute um you know it, it's all part of this tussle uh, that's going on here nobody's necessarily very likable but then sometimes their motivations aren't as bad as they appear um i think that's i, I don't think we can say anyone's got desperately great motive uh, motives anywhere but uh, they're not necessarily all terrible motives uh sort of damning with faint praise um uh, the, 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 the the these characters um about how they how they work the the, the politics of the day, uh, Francis Eric. Yeah, I had to laugh at that moment where Lancaster said some uh, said to Queen Isabel or something like, "I oh, don't worry, as soon as Gaveston's in France, she, the king will soon forget about him." And I just thought, "Have you been paying attention?" <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, Eric. I was just going to say that it's interesting how um, I don't know what the sort of social order is, but uh, like the hierarchy of lords kind of where um, uh, Lancaster said something and then the others respond, uh, which seems to be like sort of it's almost as if he's leading the charge kind of um, he and uh, Mortimer. Um, I don't know if that's a thing or is it or it's just the way it's written. Hmm. Other thoughts, uh, Helen? Yeah, I mean, Lancaster will be uh, an uncle of the king of sorts. I mean, it, it's a royal dukedom, so he's probably Edward the first brother or cousin at worst. Um, the Mortimers kind of pop up everywhere. There is not an English history play known which doesn't have a at least one Mortimer, usually a plurality. Yeah, they're probably hiding in the background and lock crying somewhere um anyway uh yeah. we are um uh, going to move forward because we haven't finished the scene the scene is still going on they we've uh, the lords have all just reversed their uh their situation uh everybody's uh, is queen isabella uh younger mortimer and all the others are still on king edward has re-entered in mourning and uh, and so the uh, the scene of uh, uh progresses He's gone, and for his absence thus I mourn. 
The never sorrow go so near my heart as doth the want of my sweet Gaveston. And could my crown's revenue bring him back, I would freely give it to his enemies, and think I gained having bought so dear a friend. Oh, heart upon his minion. My heart is as an anvil unto sorrow, which beats upon it like the cyclops hammers, and with the noise turns up my giddy brain, and makes me frantic for my Gaveston. Ah, oh, had some bloodless fury rose from hell, and with my kingly scepter struck me dead when I was forced to leave my Gaveston. Diablo, yeah, what passions call you these? My gracious lord, I come to bring you news. That you have parlayed with your Mortimer? The Gaveston, my lord, shall be repealed. Repealed? The news is too sweet to be true. Me, if you find it so. If it be so, what will not Edward do? For Gaveston, but not for Isabel. For thee, fair queen, if thou lovest Gaveston, I'll hang a golden tongue about thy neck, seeing thou hast pleaded with so good success. No other jewels hang about my neck than these, my lord, nor let me have more wealth than I may fetch from this rich treasury. Oh, how a kiss revives poor Isabel. Once more receive my hand, and let this be a second marriage twixt thyself and me. And may it prove more happy than the first. My gentle lord, bespeak these nobles fair, that wait attendance for a gracious look, and on their knees salute your majesty. Courageous Lancaster, embrace thy king, and as gross vapours perish by the sun, even so let hatred with thy sovereign smile. Live thou with me as my companion. This salutation overjoys my heart. Warwick shall be my chiefest counsellor. These silver hairs will more adorn my court than gaudy silks or rich embroidery. Chide me, sweet Warwick, if I go astray. Oh, slay me, my lord, when I offend your grace. In solemn triumphs and in public shows, Pembroke shall bear the sword before the king. With this sword, Pembroke will fight for you. But wherefore walks young Mortimer's side? Be thou commander of our royal fleet, or if that lofty office like thee not, I make thee here Lord Marshal of the realm. My lord, I'll marshal so your enemies as England shall be quiet and you safe. And as for you, Lord Mortimer of Chirk, whose great achievements in our foreign war deserve no commonplace nor mean reward, be you the general of the levied troops that now are ready to assail the Scots. In this your grace has highly honoured me, with my nature war doth best agree. Now is the king of England rich and strong, having the love of his renowned peers. Aye, Isabel, ne'er was my heart so light. Clerk of the crown, direct our warrant forth for Gaveston to Ireland. And enter Beaumont with the warrant. Beaumont, fly, as fast as Iris or Jeff's Mercury. It shall be done, my gracious lord. And exit Beaumont. Lord Mortimer, we leave you to your charge. Now let us in and feast it royally. Against our friend, the Earl of Cornwall comes. We'll have a general tilt and tournament, and then his marriage shall be solemnized. For what you not that I have made him sure unto our cousin, the Earl of Gloucester's heir? Such news we hear, my lord. That day, if not for him, yet for my sake, who in the triumph will be challenger, Spare for no cost, we will requite your love. In this or aught, your highness shall command, command us. Thanks, gentle Warwick. Come, let's in and revel. Exuant all except for the elder Mortimer and the younger Mortimer. Nephew, I must to Scotland. Thou stayst here. Leave now to oppose thyself against the king. Thou seest, by nature, he is mild and calm, and seeing his mind so totes on Gaveston, let him without controlment have his will. The mightiest kings have had their minions. Great Alexander loved Hephaestion. 
Conquering Hercules, for Hylas wept, and for Patroclus stern Achilles drooped. Now kings only, the wisest men, Rome and Tully, loved Octavius, grave Socrates, wild Alcibiades. Then let his grace, whose youth is flexible, and promiseth as much as we can wish, freely enjoy the vain light-headed earl. Riper years will wean him from such toys. Uncle, his wanton humour grieves not me. But this I scorn, that one so basely born should by his sovereign's favour grow so pert, and riot it with the treasure of the realm, while soldiers mutiny for want of pay. He wears a lord's revenue on his back, and Midas like he jets it in the court with base outlandish cullions at his heels, whose proud fantastic liveries make such show as if that Proteus god of shapes appeared. I have not seen a dapper jack so brisk. He wears a short Italian hooded cloak, larded with pearl, and in his Tuscan cap a jewel of more value than the crown. While others walk below, the king and he from out a window laugh at such as we, and flout our train and jest at our attire. Uncle, tis this that makes me impatient. But nephew, now you see the king is changed. Then so I am, and live to do him service. But whilst I have a sword, at hand, a hand, a heart, I will not yield to any such upstart. You know my mind. Come, Uncle, let's away. And they exit the scene and the act ends. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, as stated in the chat, I think Alan uh, saying that uh, another cabinet reshuffle there. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's all it's all bring bring Gaveston back. And uh, yeah, it's uh, Edward's quite pleased. I mean, he's really not hiding how really happy he is at this this news. Um, and I yeah, make up their mind because <laughs> <laughs> Such a back and forth. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, you know, and of course, they're all now friends again. Everybody's all happy and have. No, they're not. No, they're just clearly they have done nothing that actually solves any of the structural problems that this government is facing. Is it just the first act? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's a not a short play. There's a lot, but also even 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 within uh, you know the the amount of text of it, it packs a hell of a lot of material in. Uh, you know, the years have just flown past our eyes. You know, good you know three four years I think of in real terms of of, of back and forthing over uh, Gaveston. Um, uh, you know, we've got another couple of years uh, potentially left uh, as we, uh, we 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 head further into uh, the, the, the life story of Gaveston. Uh, so yeah, a lot packed in. Aliki? Uh, that's, that's what I was going to ask, how much time this is, because it does feel so fast. Um, but then I was thinking about kind of relatively recent political events in the last few years. We have seen governments that shuffle and reshuffle and reshuffle and reshuffle, trying to get over an impassable mess. And here we are. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I do think uh, I, I don't know precisely because uh, I don't have a precise chronology of, of the events. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, a few years definitely are passing here. It's it's not all happening in, in one scene. Um, uh, other thoughts about this act? I mean, just everything um, and the, you know, these uh, these people that we're meeting here. You know, they're they're they're, they're all they're all. They're all at it in some way, uh, as it were. Uh, Sarah than Eric. I thought it was quite funny that at the end there we got basically young Mortimer. He's he's not really that bothered um, about the king having favourites or you you know whatever. He's he, he, he's what he's really bothered about is the fact that Gaveston laughs at him. <laughs> I just thought, oh yeah, okay, it's all coming out now. Um, and I wondered if there was something kind of interesting that you could read into that, like whether on some level he's just really jealous of Gaveston, you know, maybe he wants that, that role for himself. I don't know, it's one way you could look at it. 
yes, any anyone anyone who has more power than you, um, you know, on 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 any level, that 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 there are threat as well, you know, it's uh, as well as jealousy, it's uh, that 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 question. And you know, I think the thing about Gaveston is he doesn't necessarily bring out the best side in the king. When we're talking mm. about you know what 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 happens to the the uh, the bishop earlier. Uh, you know, the king's as much to blame on, on that front as Gaveston is. And it's, it's, it's the king leading that. And Gaveston sort of accepting, well, if you're going to give me a, uh, the stuff, then lovely. Um, so, and, and the king was leading the, the, the insults to Isabella as well, actually. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really quite, a t perhaps it is a, a, you know, also a toxic relationship uh, on, on some level. It's, it's a, the way all these relationships, uh, you know, political and personal are, are are dancing around each other it's it's really interesting to try and uh, get a grip on it because everything's moving so fast um as well um eric yeah no i was interested how um the well i'm assuming the earl of cornwall is basically uh, galveston at this point yes. um so they've already decided to marry him off for like safety reasons i'm guessing or is it just sort of like um yeah let's marry him off so no one can talk anymore or complain Helen. to consolidate his power no it's it, it's it's money uh the earl of gloucester has only daughters and uh gaveston is acquiring the riches of the earldom of gloucester by marriage uh which of course will annoy everybody else who wanted their son or themselves to marry the earl of gloucester's heir mm. Okay, we need to move forward uh, into Act Two. We have a relatively short scene to open it, and then a massive scene which we don't know how far we're going to get through. Uh, so, Act Two, Scene One, we're going to encounter some new characters. Enter the younger Spencer and Baldock. Spencer, seeing that our Lord, the Earl of Gloucester, is dead, which of the nobles dost thou mean to serve? Not Mortimer, nor any of his side. Because the king and he are enemies. Bolder, learn this with me. A factious lord shall hardly do himself good, much less us. He that hath the favour of a king may with one word advance us while we live. The liberal earl of Cornwall is the man on whose good fortune Spencer's hope depends. What? Mean you then to be his follower? No. His companion, for he loves me well, would once have preferred me to the king. But he is banished. There's small hope of him. For a while. Baldock, mark the end. Friend of mine told me in secrecy that he's repealed and is sent for back again. Even now, post came from the court with letters to our lady from the king. As she read, she smiled which makes me think it is about her lover, Gaveston. Tis like enough, for since he was exiled, she neither walks abroad nor comes in sight. But I had thought the match had been broke off and that his banishment had changed her mind. Our lady's first love is not wavering. Well, I for thine, she will have Gaveston. Then hope I by her means to be preferred, having read unto her since she was a child. Oh, Baldo, you must cast the scholar off. Learn to court it like a gentleman. It is not a black coat and a little band, velvet caped cloak, faced before with serge and smelling to a nosegay all the day, or holding the napkin in your hand, or saying a long grace at the table's end, or making low legs to a nobleman, or looking downward, your eyelids close and saying, truly I may please your honour and get you the favour with great men, you must be proud, bold, pleasant, resolute, and now again stab as the occasion serves. Spencer, thou knowest I hate such formal toys and use them but of mere hypocrisy. My old lord, whilst he lived, was so precise that he would take exceptions of my buttons and being like pin's head, blame pin's heads, blame me for the bigness, which made me curate-like in mine attire, though inwardly licentious enough, 
and apt for any kind of villainy. I am none of these common pedants. I, that cannot speak without pro propteria quod. One of those that says, quando quidem, that's a special gift to form a verb. Leave off this jesting. Here comes my, here my lady comes. Enter King Edward's niece. Grief for his exile was not so much as is the joy of his returning home. This letter came from my sweet Gaveston. What needst thou love thus to excuse thyself? I know thou couldst not come and visit me. I will not long be from thee, though I die. This argues the entire love of my Lord. When I forsake thee, death sees my heart. But stay thee here, where Gaveston shall sleep. And she puts the letter into her bosom. Now to the letter of my lord the king. He wills me to repair unto the court and meet my Gaveston. Oh, why do I stay, seeing here that he talks thus of my marriage day? Who's there? Baldock, see that my coach be ready. I must hence. It shall be done, madam. And meet me at the Pale Park presently. And exit Baldock. Spencer, stay you and bear me company, for I have joyful news to tell thee of. My lord of Cornwall is a-coming over, and will be at the court as soon as we. Mm -hmm. I knew the king would have him home again. If all things sort out as I hope they will, thy service, Spencer, shall be thought upon. I humbly thank your ladyship. Come, lead the way. I long till I am there. And exit. So short, interesting scene. Uh, we're encountering ki uh, characters who will have uh, larger or smaller influence on the play later on. Um, we've got some nice little uh, bits of banter uh, between uh, uh, characters. Uh, thoughts uh, on this scene and the people we've just been introduced to? Uh, Eric? It just sounds like they're they've got like one of those like I don't know sort of Cosmo magazines going like oh yeah and you know about him and that's what they're doing and like oh yeah that's, 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 that's can you imagine being him and yeah it's so funny isn't it yeah and like just I don't know it was just fun yeah <laughs> yes I like that as a modern analogy uh, other thoughts. Uh, Helen. Yes, there's something here about the hypocrisy of service, which you quite often don't get in people who are not out and out villains. You know, you get these people who slink on and say to the audience, I serve him, but for my own ends. Um, but here you've actually got people talking about the practicalities of picking your prince. Mm. Um, and, and they're not, I mean, they may turn out to be out and out villains, but they're not showing it at the moment. Mm. This is just the, the ordinary servant's dilemma. Pick the guy who isn't going to land you in prison. Yeah, and then we get the 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 niece. Um, uh, the, I, don't know. We, we, I, I do love the bit of expositionary dialogue at the beginning. You know, seeing that our lord, the Earl of Gloucester, is dead. Um, <laughs> su subtle as a brick, there, uh, Marlow. <laughs> subtle as a brick. Um, here is this big, big exposition malice, and I'm just going to hit you over the head with it. Bam. Um, so yeah, we know who they are, where they're placed, and uh, so the uh, uh, the uh, he, the dead uh, Gloucester's daughter, uh, Edward's niece, comes in, and she's obviously very keen on uh, this idea of marriage with Gaveston, uh, though she hasn't met him. Uh, I think was inferred by that. So you know, there's this idea of uh, of of who she's going to marry here. So there's something really interesting about that in relation to these other people who are, who are in the room as well. Um, any thoughts on the room? Uh, Helen. As the king's niece, it is very, very strange that she isn't worried about his lack of birth. Mm. I mean, really strange. This, this struck me. I, I, why do you say she's never met him? 
Yeah, I was wondering that as Doesn't well. Doesn't she say it at some point? Um, well, she hasn't my, oh, no, no, so I misinterpreted line. Uh, that's why I said it out loud, was in part to just check whether I, I was getting that right or wrong. Um, I mean, I think she must have done. I can think of no other reason why she should, would be so keen mm. than that she loves him, because he is in many, many ways, a completely unsuitable match for her. Yeah, the grief for his exile was not so much as is the joy of his returning home. That does kind of imply that she has met him and, and there's kind of, and is missing him. Uh, and that this contract is of, of some standing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I say these things out loud to te test whether I'm right or wrong, because sometimes <laughs> I'm not paying attention. Um, like like members of the audience, that's that's all part of the plan," he said. Desperate rearguard action there. Um, okay, uh, moving on into Act Two, Scene Two. It's a long old scene. I don't know how far we're going to get. Uh, we're going to just sort of keep going. Um, I'm going to say that uh, Aliki, we're going to hand you uh, Kent uh, for the moment because there's a clash with Queen Isabella during this scene. So Elizabeth, remain Queen Isabella. Aliki, you should be able to be Kent as well as uh, do your uh, messenger and guard duties. I don't think they clash. If they do, I'll suddenly leap in and be a messenger and a, or a guard. Uh, I think that's going to work, he said, because I wasn't sure if we were going to get this far. So let's see how far we get with Act 2, Scene 2. Big old scene again. Uh, we open with the entrance of King Edward, Queen Isabella, Kent, Lancaster, the younger Mortimer, Warwick, Pembroke, and attendants, etc., etc. King Edward, King Edward enters. You can do it with stroking cat. I'm, I, I, I was going to say, sorry. <laughs> he was being remarkably cute at that very moment again. Okay. Uh, I, I, I see no reason why King Ed I see King Edward being a cat person myself. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see it being a dog, dog, dog person kind of king. So uh, yeah, go, go with it. Go with it. Enter King Edward and the rest of the court generally. The wind is good. I wonder why he stays. I fear me. He is wrecked upon the sea. Look, Lancaster, how passionate he is, and still his mind runs on his minion. My lord. How now? What news? Is Gaveston arrived? Nothing but Gaveston. What means, Your Grace? You have matters of more weight to think upon. The King of France sets foot in Normandy. A trifle. We'll expel him when we please. But tell me, Mortimer, what's thy device against the stately triumph for we decreed? A homely one, my lord, not worth the telling. Pray thee, let me know it. But seeing you are so desirous, thus it is. A lofty cedar tree, fair flourishing, on whose top branches kingly eagles perch, and by the bark a canker creeps me up, and gets unto the highest bough of all. The motto, aquae tandem. And what is yours, my lord of Lancaster? My lord, mine is more obscure than Mortimer's. Pliny reports there is a flying fish where all the, which all, all the other fishes deadly hate and therefore being pursued, it takes the air. No sooner is it up, but there's a fowl that seizes it. Seizes it. This fish, my lord, I bear the, the motto this, undique mors est. Proud Mortimer. Ungentle Lancaster. Is this the love you bear your sovereign? Is this the fruit your reconcilement bears? Can you in words make show of amity and in your shields display your rancorous minds. What call you this? But private libeling against the Earl of Cornwall and my brother. Sweet husband, be content. They all love you. They love me not that hate my Gaveston. I am that cedar. Shake me not too much. And you, the eagle, saw ye ne'er so high. I have the jesses that will pull you down. And aque tandem shall that canker cry ouch, unto the proudest peer of Brittany, thou that compares him to a flying fish and threatenest death, whether he rise or fall, tis not the hugest monster of the sea, nor foulest harpy that shall swallow him. If in his absence thus he favours him, what will he do when as he shall be present? 
that we shall see. Look where his lordship come. Indeed, enter Gaveston. My Gaveston, welcome to Tinmouth, welcome to thy friend. Thy absence made me droop and pine away, for as the lovers of fair Danae, when she was locked up in a brazen tower, desired her more and waxed outrageous, so did it fare with me. And now thy sight is sweeter far than was thy parting, hence bitter and irksome to my sobbing heart. Sweet Lord and King, your speech preventeth mine. Yet have I words left to express my joy. The shepherd, nipped with biting winter's rage, frolics not more to see the painted spring than I do to behold your majesty. Will none of you salute my Gaveston? Uh, salute him. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome, welcome, Lord Chamberlain. Welcome is the good Earl of Cornwall. Welcome, Lord Governor of the Isle of Man. Welcome, Master Secretary. Brother, do you hear them? Still will these earls and barons use me thus? My lord, I cannot brook these injuries. I me, poor soul, when these begin to jar. Return it to their throats, I'll be thy warrant. Base, leaden earls that glory in your birth. Go sit at home and eat your tenant's beef, and come not here to scoff at Gaveston, whose mounting thoughts did never creep so low as to bestow a look on such as you. Yet I disdain not to do this for you. And draws his sword and offers to stab Gaveston. Treason, treason, where's the traitor? Here, here. Convey hence Gaveston, they'll murder him. The life of thee shall salve this foul disgrace. Villain thy life, unless I miss mine aim. And wounds Gaveston. Furious Mortimer, what hast thou done? No more than I would answer were he slain. Exit Gaveston with attendants. Yes, more than thou canst answer, though he live. Dear shall you both abide this riotous deed out of my presence. Come not near the court. I'll not be barred the court for Gaveston. We'll hail him by the ears unto the block. Look to your own heads, his is sure enough. Look to your own crown if you back him thus. Warwick, these words do ill beseem thy years. Nay, all of them conspire to cross me thus. But if I live, I'll tread upon their heads that think with high looks thus to tread me down. Come, Edmund, let's away and levy men. Tis war that must abate these barons' pride. Exuant King Edward, Queen Isabella, and Kent. Let's to our castles, for the king is moved. Moved may he be, and perish in his wrath. Cousin, it is no dealing with him now. He means to make us stoop by force of arms, and therefore let us jointly here protest to prosecute that Gaveston to the death. By heaven, the abject villain shall not live. I'll have his blood, or die in seeking it. The lie goes Pembroke takes. And so doth Lancaster, now... Send our heralds to defy the king and make the people swear to put him down. Enter a messenger. Letters from whence? From, uh, from Scotland, my lord. Uh, giving letters to Mortimer. Uh, why, why, how now, cousin? How fare all our friends? My uncle's taken prisoner by the Scots. We'll have him ransomed, man. Be of good cheer. They rate his ransom at 5,000 pound. Who should defray the money but the king, seeing he is taken prisoner in his walls? I'll to the king. Do, cousin, and I'll bear thee company. Meanwhile, time, my lord of Pembroke and myself will to Newcastle here and gather head. About it, then, and we will follow you. Be resolute and full of secrecy. I warrant you. And exits with Pembroke. Cousin... And if you will not ransom him, I'll thunder such a peal into his ears as never subject did unto his king. Cousin, I'll be yeah, content, I'll bear my part. Hello, who's there? Enter a guard. I marry such a guard as this doth well. Lead on the way, guard. Whither will your lordships? Whither else but to the king? His highness is disposed to be alone. So he may, but we will speak to him. You may not in, my lord. May we not? Enter King Edward and Kent. 
Now, what noise is this? Who have we here? Is it you? And decides to go again. And they stay, my lord. I come to bring you news. Mine uncle's taken prisoner by the Scots. Then ransom him. Was in your wars, you should ransom him. Said you will ransom him, or else... What, Mortimer? You will not threaten him. Quiet yourself. You shall have the broad seal to gather for him throughout the realm. Your minion Gaveston had thought you this. My lord, the family of the Mortimers are not so poor, but would they sell their land to levy men enough to anger you? We never beg, but use such prayers as these. Shall I still be haunted thus? Nay, now you are here alone, I'll speak my mind. And so will I, and then, my lord, farewell. The idle triumphs, masks, lascivious shows, and prodigal gifts bestowed on Gaveston have drawn thy treasury dry and made thee weak. The murmuring commons overstretched break. Look for rebellion, look to be deposed. Thy garrisons are beaten out of France, and laymen poor lie groaning at the gates. The wild O'Neill, with swarms of Irish currents, lives uncontrolled within the English pale. Unto the walls of York the Scots make a road, and unresisted drive away rich spoils. The haughty Dane commands the narrow seas, while in the harbour ride thy ships unrigged. What foreign prince sends the ambassadors? Who loves thee but a sort of flatterers? Thy gentle queen, sole sister to Baloy, um, uh, complains that thou hast left her all for for forlorn. My court is naked, being bereft of those that make a king seem glorious to the world. I mean the peers, whom thou sh shouldst dearly love. Libels are cast against thee in the street, ballads and rhymes made of thy overthrow. The northern borderers, seeing their houses burnt, their wives and children slain, run up and down, cursing the name of thee in Gaveston. When wert thou in the field with banner spread but once? And then thy soldiers marched like players with garish robes, not armour, and thyself bedaubed with gold, rode laughing at the rest, nodding and shaking of thy spangled crest, where women's favours hung like labels down. And thereof came it, the, the, the fleering Scots, to England's high disgrace, have made this jig. Maids of England, sore may you mourn for your le lemons you have lost at Bannockburn. With a heave and a hoe, what weaneth the king of England soon to have... So soon to have won Scotland with a rum below. Wigmore shall fly to set my uncle free. And when tis gone, our swords shall purchase more. If you be moved, revenge it as you can. Look next to see us with our ensigns spread. And exit Lancaster with younger Mortimer, giving uh, King Edward plenty of time to reply. Uh, we're just going to briefly pause there because there's, there's a lot going on here. There is, <laughs> frankly, too much going on here. Great speed. Um, and we've only got a little bit of the scene left to do, so I'm just going to briefly pause just so we can catch our breath before we do the last few bits of that. Um, but yeah, they're all waiting for the arrive return of Gaveston. Um, King Edward's sort of doing a lot of that. And uh, is he coming? Is he here? Is he here yet? Is he, is he here? Is he here yet? Is he, is he here? And then he arrives and they stab him. <laughs> Poor Isabella went to all that trouble to explain to Mortimer, and then secretly, when he's settled, we'll get some fog, and up, oh, stab. Yeah, stabby time, and, and not even fatal stabby time by the looks of it. Just, just, just my, small hole, little, 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 little bit of blood, nice little scar. This is what happens when you stab them with a ruler. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we get all this this message, and having just really teed off the king. Mortimer gets this thing of, oh, I need money. Let's go to the king. He'll be really receptive to this idea of raising some money for me. Uh, I, yeah, I'm just going, really? You thought that was going to go well? <laughs> yeah, so, um, and then they just, once the king says uh, no, uh, they they just go off at him. I just love the way that you know Mortimer says, "I'll speak my mind," and then Lancaster goes, "Oh, I will as well." I, I... <laughs> it's like someone lets that genie out of the bottle, <laughs> and there's no way it's going back in. I love doing that scene though. I don't know how you felt about it, Eric, but that was just 
it was like gallopy, gallopy, gallopy. I am yeah. just going to like tell you off and everything that's been in my mind. For the, but it wasn't like he was holding it in before. So I, I don't know, but it was the, the, the pace of it, it was really exhilarating. Yeah. yeah, also it's just like sort of dumping blame on him, just sort of like, and they said this and they said that, and you know that your face is ugly and that one, and yeah, and that, and it's like, it's just, it, yeah. And, and your father um, smells of elderberries. Yeah, it's, all that. It's, it's just I, the, the, the pace of this. I mean, it just mm. keeps going. Because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm muting when I see other, it's a long page worth of speech uh, or text or whatever and there's no stage directions i mute myself and then suddenly where did that page go uh it just it just disappears um and you know that's that's just the just simply it's like the play knows that it's got so much to pack in that it's just forcing you to go fast um uh eric well, what I found interesting was there was a bit where they were swearing the oath and stuff after having stabbed Gaveston, uh, and uh, Lancaster goes, "Yeah, okay, be secret about it. You know, we're we're gonna uh, cause problems, but we're you know just don't tell anyone. But like we've already stabbed Gaveston, so as if he doesn't know that it's coming. Mm. It just feels a bit." Well, we just have a, a little bit of scene left, uh, so um, we're just going to complete that now uh, to get to the end of this uh, scene. So Lancaster and Younger Mortimer have just done their, their massive thing. Uh, Leaky, yes. Am I still Kent? Yeah, stay Kent, I suppose. Uh, Isabella's coming on in a second anyway, so okay. uh, it, uh, uh, it makes sense. Uh, so, uh, yes, so uh, they've gone. Edward's sort of alone with his brother going, what? Um, and let's see how it goes. My swelling heart for very anger breaks. How oft have I been baited by these peers and dare not be revenged for their powers great? Yet shall the crowning of these cockerels affright a lion? Edward, unfold thy paws and let their lives' blood slick thy fury's hunger. If I be cruel and grow tyrannous, now let them thank themselves and rue too late. M my lord, I see your love to Gaveston will be the ruin of the realm and you. For now the wrathful nobles threaten wars, and therefore, brother, banish him forever. Art thou an enemy to my Gaveston? Aye, and it grieves me that I favoured him. Traitor! Be gone, wind thou with Mortimer. So will I rather than with Gaveston. Out of my sight and trouble me no more. No marvel though thou scorn thy noble peers when I, thy brother, am rejected thus. Away. And exit, exit brother Kent. Poor Gaveston, thou hast no friend but me. Do what they can, they'll live in Tynmouth here and we'll live in Tynmouth here. And so I walk with him about the walls. What care I, though the earls begirt us round? Here comes she that is cause of all these jars. Ooh, yes. Mm. Enter Queen Isabella with uh, Edward's niece, uh, two ladies, uh, Gaveston, Baldock, and the younger Spencer. My lord, to thought the earls are up in arms. I and tis likewise thought you favour him. Thus do you so suspect me, that horse? Sweet uncle, speak more kindly to the queen. My lord, dissemble with her, speak her fair. Pardon me, sweet, I forgot myself. Your pardon is quickly got, to Isabel. The younger Mortimer has grown so brave that to my face he threatens civil wars. Why do you not commit him to the tower? I dare not, for the people love him well. Why, then, will have him privily made away? Would Lancaster and he had both carused a bowl of poison to each other's health. But let them go, and tell me what are these? Two of my father's servants, whilst he lived, may it please your grace to entertain them now. Tell me, where wast thou born? What is thine arms? My name is Baldock, and my gentry I fetched from Oxford, not from heraldry. The fit art thou, Baldock, for my turn. Wait on me, and I'll see thou shalt not want. I humbly thank your majesty. 
Knowst thou him, Gaveston? Ay, my lord, his name is Spencer. He is well allied. For my sake, let him wait upon your grace. Gare shall you find a man of more desert. Then, Spencer, wait upon me for his sake. I'll grace thee with a higher style ere long. No greater titles happen unto me than to be favoured of your majesty. Cousin, this day shall be your marriage feast, and Gaveston, think that I love thee well to wed thee to our niece, the only heir unto the Earl of Gloucester late deceased. I know, my lord, many will stomach me, but I respect neither their love nor hate. The headstrong barons shall not limit me. He that I list to favour shall be great. Come, let's away, and when the marriage ends, have at the rebels and their complices. And the scene ends. So, uh, yeah, we're going to worry, worry, marriage-iness. <clears throat> um, it, it, it's... Yeah, and we've uh, got the, the the people we met encountered in the previous scene so so long ago um, have now entered the uh, the wider political arena, and uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Kent Kent being very reasonable, the Liberal Democrat of this coalition, um, uh, you know, desperately desperately saying, you know, shall 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 we not, you know. I've nothing personally against Gaveston, but we're really screwed if we keep him here. Um, I have no skin in this game. Just, just can we not have a civil war? That would be nice. Um, that's that didn't work. Didn't work there. So we are good, good, good old, uh, a good third, maybe even slightly more of the way into the play. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, generally uh, a little sort of closing discussion. I'm not necessarily going to do uh, a full round of uh, final thoughts around the room. I'm going to just sort of see see where we're at. I mean, this is a difficult uh, play in the sense to do a first look at because I've seen it about four times in different productions, and you know this play is very very familiar to me. So I'm quite interested in those who haven't seen it before. What's coming out at you, um, uh, and any thoughts from that? Um, so uh, who wants to leap in uh, about the play so far and how you found yeah. it? What has amazed? I thought I knew the play quite well. Uh, what has amazed me is that how little is Edward and Gaveston when we're just reading the lines, and how much is everybody else? Because when you see it, usually it's all Edward and Gaveston, and the rest are a bunch of indistinguishable angry guys. Um, Whereas here, you're, uh, because we're reading it this way, uh, we're, we're getting a good sense of who everybody else is. Mm. I wonder whether, too, it's about nobody is shocked in 2021 that the King and Gaveston are in love, even though they're both men. So maybe we don't need to dwell on the, look how gay this is, look how gay, gay love, gay love so much. And we can just go, hey, politics. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they, they all intersect. I mean, I, it's uh, in, in the ways it, it works and the mindset. I mean, again, like the other play we've been doing this week, Galatea, the, the question of a generational thing is comes into play here as well. <laughs> Um, it's not entirely because obviously we have a younger Mortimer, but a younger Mortimer seems very much on the wavelength with uh, the older Mortimer. Um, uh, but you know, established class structures is a really important aspect of this as well. People who are trying to change their status in society, and again, for everyone who did Thomas Woodstock, there's a good connection there with questions that I think possibly Woodstock does the class thing slightly better, but that's uh, to be debated. Uh, Francis. Yeah, the uh, the animosity towards Gaveston uh, seems to be chiefly motivated by uh, by 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 his class. Um, the fact the, uh, the fact that um, you know he's the king's lover uh, seems to be secondary. Very few, nobody seems to be saying this. Is, you know, this is shocking and immoral that they're carrying on this way. It, it seems um, it seems to be much more to do with class. 
And it's it's also this situation of Isabel, uh, Isabella. I mean, uh, and the way that again they continue talking about her in that. Uh, I forget that moment. Um, you know, oh yeah, there, here she comes. That is the cause of all these jars. I yeah. mean, sod you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Edward, Edward says some really, really nasty things. Um, he's very difficult to like, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's really interesting in that way. Edward comes off as very narcissistic. Um, in that way and the kind of the, the paranoia of narcissism which you know i'm not going to draw any direct parallels but the paranoia of narcissism mm. uh, tamara well i just i had a really hard time with that particular line where edward just turns on his brother and goes are you an enemy of gaveston because it's just <laughs> you it's almost on the first read is impossible to read that straight because it's just okay chill <laughs> just just chill a minute um he is he is not in love he's obsessed to me yeah it's 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 an either or thing with him whereas kent is making a very reasonable statement actually of just going look i don't it's i've got nothing there's nothing personal but we're in really, this is a very simple solution to all of our problems. And it's just no, uh, uh, with me or against me. Um, G uh, Emma, you were Gaveston. Uh, how are you? I'll go to Eric and Stephen in a moment. But Emma, uh, you were Gaveston. Uh, do you feel you have a handle on what's, what's going on with this guy? Because we have a little bit inside his mind at the very beginning. But then, uh, you know, well, yeah. and little hints and other things later on. Um, this is my first time looking at the play. Um... So uh, these are all kind of quite new thoughts. Um, yeah, Gaveston and that kind of central relationship, it's so, it's so interesting to me. It's so, so many classical references, so much lover's language. It's, it's so all consuming. And um, as to Gaveston's motivations, uh, yeah, we got, we got a couple of hints at the beginning about how he may be playing the king. Um, but everything, I don't know, to me, it just, it all seemed very genuine. Um, the way he feels about him when he, when he, uh, when he has to go away, when he has to come back. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, looking for more evidence. Maybe that'll come out later as to maybe what other motives he has, but I, I'm just kind of taking what, what I've kind of got from the surface of, of this first reading. Mm. Uh, Eric, then Stephen, then Sarah. I was just going to say that um, it's inter well. We were talking about the speed, which is very, very interesting. It's just like, boom, 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 boom. but also it's just um, that whole thing with um, King Edward being basically him and Gaveston against the world. It's just very, very power. It's very powerful, especially when you get like younger Mortimer and Lancaster ganging up on him at the like right before those. So, well, basically, right before the bit we did, uh, the last bit we did, uh, we, it feels very sort of like escalating, escalating, and now we're going to go to war, sort of. So the whole, like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm intrigued. And also, it feels like the dark side of Galatea, where, like, or the dark side of Cupid <laughs> that we did yesterday, <laughs> where it's like, love is madness, love is a disease, and this is how it can ruin a kingdom. Yeah, it does. It does seem that the Edward side it does seem to be more obsessional, whereas Gaveston isn't. I doesn't say he's there isn't affection, but uh, you know there isn't love. But it it doesn't seem as all encompassing in the same way as Edward's is. It does seem to be a slightly different side of a relationship. But then I don't know. Uh, Stephen, then Sarah. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a gloss on on Rob's point, really. Um, it's a shame he didn't live another twenty years, isn't it? He, he did what he did in five years flat, I think. And um, it seems to me, you know, to kind of bring it up to a modern parallel, it's, it's something like the trajectory of the Beatles, you know, something that takes in Tamburlaine, uh, Faustus, Massacre, etc., etc. He's He's 27 when this comes out, and, and this is, you know, might well be his last play. And the thing that strikes me about it is he's not thinking in scenes. He's kind of inventing... A, a sub-scene unit, if you like. 
which which is I think the reason why it comes across to me as so cinematic. You know that we we are he's he's kind of working with a different sort of form, which is you know okay this is he's storyboarding it let's put it that way and some you know sometimes it's going to last thirty seconds and sometimes it's going to last five minutes and everything in between and that seems to me to be to be very fresh and very new and also seems to be the root of the pacing he's 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 not thinking on. I've got, you know, four of these in this act. He's going, okay, these things need to happen. How can I get them all in? Right, that's got to be four lines. This can be 20 lines. Mm. Yeah, and, it, and it's the, the economy with which, uh, you know, information is given. You know, in another play, we might have a scene where people are going off and, you know, there's there's a war happening and there's going to be a bannock burn and happening somewhere else and maybe we've got some characters talking about it here. No, it, it, it doesn't matter. We just, it's, it's, it's happened. It's gone. It's passed. Uh, here are the here are the implications of of that thing happening, that's happening somewhere else, and it's it's really interesting how that's that that just stuff just keeps flying at you, and maybe there's there's an element of that that element of the the, the psychodrama of just in real life things just keep coming at you, um, and and you're reacting, and you don't necessarily have the time to think about uh, how to react to things. Sarah, uh, and then I saw other people, but I was Sarah first. Uh, muted at the moment. He wanted. Um, yes, it was just following on um, from what Emma uh, had said, but then Eric kind of um, said it for me, really. It, it, I, I do kind of feel slightly that Gaveston is from a different play and he's wandered in. Um, he's from some kind of uh, bucolic uh, pastoral comedy. Um, yeah, like maybe a Lily play, and he's just kind of wandered into the middle of all this, you know, disastrous royal uh, politicking. Um, but also picking up on what Stephen said about storyboarding, I thought that was a really good point. And it 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 just made me think that um, I, I, I haven't read this before. This is all new to me. Um, and normally when we when we're doing these first uh, read throughs, because I don't tend to know these plays, um, usually the part of my brain that gets activated is the director's part um, or sometimes the writer uh, or editor part of me kind of um, takes precedence but actually reading today and I don't know if it's just because I was reading Mortimer and he was a very interesting character but it like I really found like the actor uh in me was really enjoying this play and I think that's to do with the um what Stephen was talking about um in terms of the the way um, Marlowe frames it, the structure he gives it, the storyboarding that he gives it, and, and then what you were saying, Rob, about the pace, because the pace is just so fantastic. And all of these characters, I mean, um, um, I think Helen was saying earlier about, uh, you know, it's it's not just about Gaveston and the King, and it isn't. All of these characters have such momentum to them. And um, I, I, I just really enjoyed it. And I know it's a play that gets, you know, done um, more than many of the others we we look at, but I'm kind of hoping, Rob, that you will do a second look on this because I would love to have a, a the, the actor in me would love to have a bash at doing one of these roles with a bit of preparation because it's just it's just a joy. It's a bit of joy to read. Well, it is it. I mean, I say I've seen it several times uh, or heard it several times. I don't think I've ever heard it un or seen it uncut. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never seen the poor men scene. Uh, on stage, uh, you know, it, it, I've seen um, Gaveston coming on, doing a speech, his beginning of his speech, and then the end of his speech, and the middle bit gone. Uh, I don't think I've ever actually uh, encountered that, uh, and how that changes it. You know, it is a long play; doing it uncut is difficult. So, a second look to look at the text over, say, two sessions at pace might be uh, uh, might be a, 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 a very valuable thing. Let's say uh, it, it is one of those those things. It's quite uh, uh, there's there's a lot. It is a bit of a wall of, of text. And, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, um, is it Prospect Theatre, the uh, Ian McKellen version that uh, is available on DVD in various regions. I don't know if it is available in region two uh, at the moment. I, it was planned to be released. I don't know if it was. Um, which was a filmed version for the BBC uh, uh, from a stage show. And it's a very, very much a stage show. Uh, and they go, it's just, it's like you're watching it on 1.5 speed. 
Um, it, 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 it's everybody's just moving like the clappers all the way. And that's cut, even that's, that text is cut down. So uh, it's, I don't think it's just that everybody's looking over their shoulder at how much time they've got, um, uh, though there is an element of that. It, it, the text seems to be wanting that to happen. And that seems to be something there. Um, but yes, uh, any, I'm not going to say go around the room uh, wholly. If anyone's got any final thoughts they want to pitch in at this last moment, as before I close the session now, wave or forever hold your peace. Eric. Um, I, I was just going to make a point that I remembered from another play that we were doing. I think it was Sophonispa, which is not a history play, but anyway. Um, and um, it, I think we, we were talking about this where there's no clown. Like there, there, there are clowns in this where like funny scenes and funny elements of it. But then it just goes like as soon as it hits the major plot point of like we're going to have a civil war. It just goes for the, like, the home stretch kind of thing. <laughs> That's how it feels at the moment, at least. I don't know if that's true because I've not seen it. I've never encountered it before, but it, there's no, like there's funny business, which is related to the plot. And then it just boom, goes yeah, on. Yeah. There are some characters who say something that's a bit witty. They're not inherently comedy characters in the way that, you know, uh, we, we have in other plays where uh, clown enter clown with, with a, a, a accompanying bag of tricks. So yeah, no, that's a good point. It's very focused on what it wants to do, isn't it? Any more for any more? Uh, okay, there are various bits of material on Marlowe and also on Edward the Second uh, available on the podcast. There will be links in the uh, the notes here. Uh, as a discussion explicitly of Edward the Second, his connection with history, uh, and this uh, this play with uh, Dr. Kit Hyam. Uh, I say there's a link to that in the podcast uh, that is out there. There's also discussions with uh, Lazarus Theatre Company about their staging of this and other Marlowe plays. Uh, that is also available on the podcast. Also available on uh, the YouTube channel. As every other play by Christopher Marlowe, uh, done either as a first or in one case a second look. Um, so at this stage of recording, so if you want to glut yourself on Marlowe and Friends with uh, occasional collaborations or intercessions by other authors, uh, then uh, do do so. All that remains, however, at this time, is to thank all the readers today and say farewell. Bye. Bye. Bye.